This video will cover the Geometry Common Core exam from August 2015, questions 7 through 11. Number 7 says a sequence of transformations maps rectangle ABCD onto the double primes as shown in the diagram below. Which sequence of transformations maps tra rectangle ABCD onto the primes and then maps the primes onto the double primes? So we're going to first label these rectangles as 1, 2, and 3. And the way that I determined 1, 2, and 3 was because this original one was the no primes. The next one was the single primes. And the last one was our double primes. So first we need to figure out how we go from rectangle ABCD onto the single primes. And you might think immediately that it's a translation, but I'm going to tell you that it's not. Because here we have rectangle A, B, C, D. And on the bottom, we have rectangle A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. But notice when we read the coordinates, starting at A, going clockwise, we get A, B, C, D, just like you would think. But if I start here at A prime again and read clockwise again, I now have A prime, D prime, C prime, B prime. Notice that the orientation the order of the letters is different. A, B, C, D is different than A, D, C, B. So orientation changes. Which means that we can get rid of the choices that talk about a translation that happens first. Because first thing when we change the orientation is a reflection. A is currently 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 squares away from the x-axis. And I can bet you that if I count to the A prime, I'm going to have 6 squares again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. When the distance is the same between the x-axis on either side, then we know that it's a reflection. Also because the orientation changed. Now we have to decide what's happening between triangle two, or not triangles, these are rectangles, between rectangle two and three. How do I swing A such that it maps on A double prime? How do we swing B prime so that it maps on B double prime? Oops, I circled the wrong ones. B prime to B double prime. And say D to D double prime. So you can see here that it's not just being simply slid, which is what a translation does, slides but instead it is being rotated, or in other words, turned. So our choice here should be number one. Number eight says, in the diagram of parallelogram Fred, shown below, ED is extended to A, and AF is drawn such that AF is congruent to DF. Uh, if measure of angle R is 124, what is the measure of angle AFD? So A to F to D. I'm going to label that as an X. I want to know what X is. So because we have a parallelogram, we know a lot of things. Um, but as far as angles go with a parallelogram, we know that opposite angles are congruent. And adjacent angles are supplementary. So here, if I'm looking at this parallelogram, Fred, F-R-E-D, I know that the angle opposite of R is also 124 degrees. Again, that's because opposite angles are congruent. Now, if we think about angles on a straight line, currently we have 124 and say Y. Two angles on a straight line sum to 180. So Y plus 124 equals 180. Do a little math and find out that we get 56. So this angle right here is now 56. But notice that we also had a triangle where we had two congruent sides. If it's got two congruent sides, it's called isosceles. Which then means that there are two congruent angles. And those angles are opposite of the congruent sides. So if my triangle currently has a 56 degree base angle, the other base angle must also be 56. So now remember our goal is to find x, and x is the vertex of the isosceles triangle. And we also know that three angles in a triangle 
sum to 180. Go ahead and take a second to do that math and then hopefully at that point you should be able to circle your answer. Do that math, pause the video, and then check back in. Okay, so I did the math. I found that x is 68. Remember, originally we called angle AFD x, so our choice here is 3. That means answers for this page, we have number 7 is 1, and number 8 is 3. In number 9, it says that x squared plus 4x plus y squared minus 6y minus 12 equals 0 is the equation of a circle. The length of the radius is blank. So we're asked to fill in the blank here. Now, equation of a circle can be written in one of two ways. The first way is using this messy form. It's called this uh, general form, where we have x's and y's and numbers and linear terms and quadratic terms, and it's just a big old mess. But the nice way to write the equation of a circle is using something called standard form, where we have x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared equals the radius squared. So our goal is to find the radius, which means if we can write it in this form, we can just take the radius and square root r squared. So take the r squared square root and get the radius. But we probably need to do a little bit of work before we can get to that point. Because this equation that they gave us is nice and messy and beautiful, but it doesn't lead to the answer that we need right away. You'll notice that I'm setting up the equation to the right where I'm grouping x terms with x terms, y terms with y terms, but I'm also adding in these plus blanks. And then I'm also going to move this 12 to the other side, move that constant term to the other side. So now I have a positive 12 plus blank plus blank. What I um, really dislike about the way that they space this question is that you pretty much have no space to work which might lead some students to think that it requires no work. However, it does require quite a bit of work. What we have to do here is actually complete the square. Notice that our final equation, the standard equation, has squares all throughout that equation. x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. So we have to make these perfect squares in order to find uh, what the radius and the center are. In order to do that, we take our b, divide it by 2, and then square it. b is the linear term, so in this case it's 4. So off to the side I take 4, divide it by 2, and square it, which gives me 4. So I'm adding 4 to both sides. Whatever you do to one side, you must do to the other. Then I'm going to do something similar for the y's. Take the b value, negative 6, Divide it by 2 and square, which gives me 9. You should always be adding a positive value to both sides because whether you're squaring a positive or a negative, the answer is always positive. So here now I've got x squared plus 4x plus 4 plus y squared minus 6y plus 9 equals 12 plus 4 plus 9. So we're going to do a little bit of factoring here. We can factor this first quadratic using two sets of parentheses, x in the front of both, and we can think about adding and multiplying here. We have to find two numbers that add to 4 but also multiply to 4. So if we think of factors of 4, we have 1 times 4 and 2 times 2. The only pair that would also add to 4 is 2 and 2, which is great because remember we want squares here, perfect squares. Because we're adding and multiplying to both positives, this becomes positive. Now there's an actual uh, little trick here that we can use to help us figure out these factors. All we do is take this b value, again b, and divide it by 2. Split it up, divide it by 2. So then this x plus 2 times x plus 2 actually reduces. We can simplify it, we can condense it, into an x plus 2 squared. Because remember, squaring means to multiply by itself. So then I carry down my plus sign, and now I have to do the same thing for the y's. y in the front spot of both. The trick here, again, is to take your b value and divide it by 2. Negative 3, negative 3. And if you want to double check me, we can take negative 3 and multiply by negative 3. 
that would give you positive 9. Negative 3 plus negative 3 would give you negative 6. So trust me, this work or this trick works every single time. So now when I condense, I have y minus 3 squared equals this whole sum on the right side, 12 plus 4 plus 9 more, 25. So now because they're asking me for the radius, I know that 25 is r squared. So r squared, radius squared, is 25. That means to get r by itself, I have to square root. So now my radius is 5. Choice 3. Ah, my paper just went crazy. Number 10 says, given mn the segment below with m and n as coordinates, what is the equation of the line that passes through point P and is parallel to mn? So we have to do a little bit of investigation here. First, we need to figure out what the coordinates of P are, and we need to figure out the slope of mn. Because we need it parallel, our new line parallel to this, we need to have the same slope. Remember, parallel lines never intersect, which means that they rise at the same rate of change as each other, meaning they have the same slope. So here, point P is located at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, comma 1. And it looks like the slope, if I just find two really nice points, I'm going down 2 over 3, negative 2 over 3. Remember, slope is rise over run negative 2 over 3. Now that we have a point and a slope, we're going to plug into point slope formula, which looks like y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. The x1 and the y1 are actually coming from the point, and the m, of course, is your slope. So what we need to do is start plugging in. We have y minus 1 equals negative two-thirds times the quantity x minus six. But as we can see, that's not actually a choice. So we have to do a little bit of more work. I'm gonna work to get this in y equals. So first I'm gonna distribute the negative two-thirds. So we still have y minus one equals negative two-thirds x. Negative times negative gives me positive. And two-thirds of six is 4. If you weren't sure about what 2 thirds of 6 is, you could of course type it in on your calculator, or just think you have 2 thirds times 6 over 1. Multiply straight across and you get 12 over 3, right? 2 times 6 is 12, 3 times 1 is 3, and then that of course gives you 4. 12 divided by 3 is 4. But we're still not in y equals, I have to add this 1 to both sides, so now we get y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 5, which looks like choice 1. If you wanted to use the graph for this, you could certainly do that as well and then come up with the equation afterwards. Because we know we have to pass through point P and also have a slope of negative 2 thirds, I can go down 2 over 3, plot a point. And then to go backwards, I can go left 3, up 2, plot a point. Left 3, up 2, plot a point. Left 3, up 2, plot a point like singing a little song here. So then when I graph, you of course don't have to show the steps, the ladders, but you do need to make sure that you see where your y-intercept is and you know what your slope is. Because the slope was negative two-thirds, that immediately eliminates three and four as choices. And then if you count up to your y-intercept, we have one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, yep. So here, again, choice one. Number 11 says that Linda is designing a circular piece of stained glass with a diameter of 7 inches. So I'm going to sketch a circle, diameter of 7 inches, which of course goes all the way across through the center. This whole thing is 7. She's going to sketch a square inside the circular region. Okay, so this is a little weird. She wants a square inside of here. Great. Beautiful. To the nearest tenth of an inch, the largest possible length of a side of the square is blank. Again, filling in these blanks here, that's what they seem to have you do. So I need to figure out the length of this 
side of the square or this side of the square or any side of the square because they're all the same. But I don't think that the way that I drew my picture is going to be helpful because the diameter cuts through the square. But if you also look at this, the diameter is like a diagonal of the square from one side through the center to the other. So I'm just going to resketch my picture. I have a circular piece of stained glass. I'm going to put my square right inside of it. And then I'm going to draw in the diameter, which again happens to be one of the diagonals. And I'm going to label these two sides as X. Notice here that we have a square with a right angle, which therefore means that we have a right triangle, X, X, and 7. There's a formula that helps us to find the third side of a right triangle if we're given two of the other sides. Even though we don't have two of the other sides, we know that they both are called X. So when we think about right triangles, the hypotenuse is always labeled as C. And each of the legs are labeled as A or B. The legs could be labeled as B and A or A and B. It doesn't matter. Order doesn't matter here because you're going to be plugging into something called the Pythagorean Theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So again, in this case, we had A is X squared plus B is X squared equals C is 7 squared. So now we have X squared plus X squared. That's a 1X squared plus a 1X squared to give us 2X squared equals 49. Our goal is to get X by itself, so first we need to divide by 2. So X squared equals 24.5. Then when we get x by itself, we're going to square root. I'm just going to bring my work over here. So now we have x equals 4.898987, blah, blah, blah. Now it says round into the nearest tenth. So the tenths place is the first eight. If I look to the right, the ninth nine is telling me to bump the eight up. So x equals 4.9, choice 2. So again, if the sketch doesn't work for you the first time, you should try and redraw it a second time. I did the same thing when I was doing my answer key originally. The first sketch I drew just didn't work. It didn't make sense logically. But then I thought about it and I said, okay, if I'm going to cross the circle through the center in any way, no matter where I draw it, as long as I go through the center, it's still a diameter which means that that diameter is also the diagonal of a square. So answers for this page, we have number 9 is choice 3, number 10 is choice 1, and number 11 is choice 2.